never do it again, the song. Uh, I don't really mind. This is, the idea is to, in the end, to um, experience a fair number of things with a little bit more body control, I won't say self control. We are talking a bit more as now to that. You know, um, and I hope to fill in the time when you all look tired by talking to you about the history of the Morris and where it came from and what happened to it in the 19th century and things of that sort. There's a lot of, lot of movements going on and understanding things and uh, the old conventional view that was floating around five or six years ago just is not true sure anymore. Right, now does anybody not know Atterbury? Right, the advice, advice to the, um, over the weekend is if you actually don't know a tradition, please don't dance opposite somebody else who doesn't know it either. You know, like, the idea really is, um, with the Morris, you dance with it as a pair, you try and dance with somebody. It is shuffle around a bit. Maybe. If you have enough self-confidence, it doesn't matter. Yes, it is. So, we'll see what we make of this.
time machine. Otherwise, it will be as confused as I was when I wrote it. When I set out to find the sets of words for these dances, I discovered that all the song books had different words, slightly different words. So if you find a line in brackets, it's the alternative to the line before. Or if it has in the first word, you've got two lines with brackets, then you've got a choice of three that you can see. Now, for the purpose of this workshop, I don't care which line you see. What I do care, though, is that when we get down further down the page, there's a whole verse in brackets. That actually means it's not a common version. Common verse. I think in the, in the versions, it's just a, a verse that's occurred once in the collection. Right. So. Oh, it goes on a bit, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which makes me wonder why I have not had so many figures.
course, is the traditional army the farewell dance. Two, I should say, not dance. <laughs> <laughs> As the British Army's regiments all want to you know, sail away into the blue yonder, the band always plays drill and behind it. You know, so they leave the band behind as well. Right. The band on Steve and I. No, they're usually not in the so they go and rescue them and the jet and the wounded. Yeah. Well, there's another one, ten verses, it seems most unlikely to say. But I suspect. Following what the manuscript says of their Adderbury, that in fact these were things which they just sang and sticked out, they just sang there. But <laughs> uh, well, that's great, a great way of doing it, and you just practice it, so let's um, do that. We just sing it and stick tap. Yeah. I suggest we stick tap the singles. Stick tap. Right. Yeah. Why not? <laughs>
going to prepare the tune. Yeah, I'm yeah, in a minute. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
who became a lifelong friend of mine, Alan Green. And he persuaded me to come along with Clerky Ross. Talk. They used to go, if you probably don't remember this story, but it was Bob during the war. War? You don't remember there was a war? Yeah. It was Bob, so there, there, were no, there was no shopping centre, there were heaps of rubble. And if you wanted to do a war story, you went out and caught the bus to the end of the whichever road you wanted to do, and then just worked your way through the pubs back towards the centre of town. And uh, that was rather fun. So when I found myself in 54 um, sharing a room with Adam Breeding at the hostel in Farnborough, associated with the World Aircraft Association, um, he decided that it would be a good idea that the hostel would start running dances, so we ran a weekly dance. And then he thought, well, we were actually asked by the um, Aircraft Establishment's Fate Committee, could we provide some entertainment in the fate? So we said, well, all that's required, you know, somebody had to do the costumes. That's all they So um, it was agreed we'd do that, and Alan sort of the next dance sort of asked for volunteers to join the Morrow Circles. In an establishment, there were 6,000 people, including a lot of junior technicians and young scientists. There were a fair number of Morris dancers, as there was no problem raising the sign. But the fabric shop, which in the <coughs> which is run by Sam Cody, who was his father had been the first, an American, but the first man to fly in England, um, at Bali, in fact, of course, um, he was in charge of the fabric shop, and he sort of said, well, his ladies were made costumes for us. You see, um, it might have been helpful if he'd actually consulted us over what the costume should look like. <laughs> because the women decided that pirates were the right sort of thing. <laughs> so we, we had red breeches, a little black bolero, and uh, a handkerchief around your head with a knot on one side and so on. Yeah, it was all rather fun. Um, but the great advantage of it was is that you know, we had when dancing, we were advertising fate, so we were at the local pubs. You can't do that nowadays because like in the GLC built right, major states over the fields where we used to walk us on. But I do remember the very first tour of Farmer Morris, we actually borrowed a goat for the first pub. <laughs> <laughs> I took this master along with us. And when we got to our last pub, quite late at night, uh, the landlord said, Yeah, I've enjoyed it. You asked to give you a beer. And he gave us a stainless steel bucket full of beer, you know, which we all drank as much as we could and then poured the rest of it over the audience. <laughs> So there we were back in those sort of days. And, um, yes, I, I was involved in Morris. I met the Thames Valley men who we went off to wear a feast. Uh, they became great lifelong friends. And I started um, getting interested in knowing a bit more about the dancers and where they came from. And I discovered that Alex Helm had actually gone through the Sharp manuscripts and was using index. So I actually, with Paul Williams, I read mean, actually gone through and made a note of the titles and something about the dancers that we did do. Because we had, the Morris Board had just got away from dancing for certificates and medals. You know, again, a little bit free for all. It was still the old class way of doing things. You all started with Headington and then did it with bad degree. And you weren't allowed to touch some of the traditions until your third year and so on. You know, um, there may be a bit of that still around, but they say, that's the way it was, and first of all, you were, you were persuaded to actually enter competitions. The competitions weren't public ones, they were, you know, they were between various groups, the EPSS. They had been going on all since the First World War. Um, most of them, if you talk to all the people who danced with you in the world, you find that yes, they went to places like the Corn Exchange and Devices, where all the teams from the South and South West used to get together once a year. And some of you would adjudicate, they'd all do their little bit. And it was almost strange to go along because they'd all, the ladies would all turn up in sets of six, you know, all in identical dresses. You know, not, not a Morris costume, you know, but a dress. And the women, certainly in those days, did the Morris, but never publicly. Um, when we interviewed um, a couple at Sherville Village in uh, Gloucestershire, you know, uh, about the local class uh, between the wars. Yeah, they did it. They did lots of, you know, they did Flamborough and, and so on. They did Cotswold Morris, Headington that is. Um, they did country dancing and things like this. But they only ever 
went into Oxford and danced in the annual competition. They never danced outside, never danced the freight, never did anything to anybody else in the village to see. It just wasn't the way things were done at that sort of time. So, in the situation I found was offered, that, um, there were the 80 dancers that everybody knew, because they were the published ones. And one or two teams, and I mean only one or two teams, actually did one or two others which had been collected and published in the journal of the EPSS. And the idea was, in those days, you could take a man in on one side and put him in another, and other one that's bought it, you couldn't tell the difference. They all did the same repertoire, all did it in the same sort of way, as we were trained to stand in the corner, and so on. Now, another thing that was different about the 50s and early 60s is that clubs were very small. Walgrave, from the reading, never had six dancers. You know, it was always, only had five. And Friday night was phone around night. Uh, um, I danced for all sorts of sizes, as Marjorie knows, uh, like Oxford and so on. Because they'd phone up and say, Roy, we're short. Well, not so much they were short. They're always, we're short, you know. Are you doing anything tomorrow? Could you meet us at so and so? And things like that. And it didn't match my sort of reading of what the Morris was about. Now, fortunately for the Morris work, and unfortunately for me, in April 1960, the project I was working on Blue Street was cancelled. And I was stuck in an office with a job. All the useful people were given jobs straight away. You know, I'm sure people, but I was specialised in something that actually couldn't translate to something else. You know, so I sat around for a couple of years, really, well, we tried to get a, a plot together and get some money and get the Americans interested in things like that. So I had plenty of time to actually borrow micro, uh, microfilm of uh, the sharp notes to start with with other people and sit with my microfilm reader in my office and you know, notate all these dance and things like that. So I started in the sort of 60, 61, building up a, a fairly comprehensive uh, knowledge of what had gone on. And of course, as soon as you start looking at things, you get the names like Ken Whitty, Scope, and Russell Worth, and so on. So off I went to see all these older dancers, and all the people still alive who collected, like Clive Carey and Walt Carpley, they went along there. God knows what they thought of me in those days. They used to wear a dirty mat and a scrubby hat, and so on. Um, but I was full of enthusiasm, and so on. And most of them were very kind, like Clive Carey, who showed you all the programs he had uh, from all his career. Let me borrow his notebooks and that sort. Other people organised things for me, like um, somebody one somebody told me about the two uh, Williams sisters, or well, the three of them, who were well known in the Cotswolds, I discovered, because they, they cycled everywhere and everybody knew these um, ladies. Uh, but their father had been a friend of my Carey, and he and the Clive's uh, influence had gone in. To St. Morris, and they had to have his father's notes, but they wouldn't let me borrow it. But, uh, they came, one of them came up to Isha, and uh, it, in um, Clark Carey's house, in house there, anyhow, and oh, it was his nephew, um, Henry, Henry O'Hare, who um, organised it. And I went there and I was able to scribble, I had about two and a half hours to copy and make notes. You know, so it was sort of uh, Let's do the things that I don't recognise. Um, and those things like the endless notes on Bampton, I just had to forget. For those are the days when you see it, nobody really cares about that quotation. I had met Pat Patterson with having the That's another thing. I was actually, because um, I, I was new Reg Hall, I remember Reg Hall going really to take them alone. Yeah. Um, he introduced us to Frank Pilsner. When I talk about us, I usually mean Margaret myself. To Frank and Pilsner. the children. Hmm? And the children. Yeah, all right. <coughs> yeah. But um, we were introduced to Frank, who had actually um, been acquired by the Abbey Men. Now, he'd made a mistake that I made after a while. Um, he'd gone along to see the Abbey Men and stood watching. So Jack Hyde went over to him and said, You've been interested, why don't you come and have a try? You know, and that didn't have a try, he said, Our next practice is. <laughs> yeah. So there was Frank commuting out from London. <coughs> and uh, 
he'd been dancing with a good couple of years when I was introduced to my rich, and he said, you must come up and see them dance. And I did that. <coughs> and then they were at the Rygate Ring meeting, so um, I went along with them. And as naturally, I was given the job of holding the horn, so everybody does when you start with that. And then, by the time we got late in the afternoon, the old men were getting tired of dancing. And they said, well, Roy, you've watched this you know, all, all day. It's your turn. Okay. Now, unfortunately, it was my turn to dance in the dance which I hadn't seen that day. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody explained to me that some of the oddities of Abingdon, like when they do rounds, they go the other way first. They actually not fall them over. <laughs> <laughs> Where was the other one, Roy? <laughs> so I, I got involved. I met Pat Patterson, who had been an uh, Oxford University man, doing postgraduate work at that time. Uh, very useful. He was actually working on um, the chemistry of ordinary things, but where the um, hydrogen was replaced with deuterium. You know, he discovered all the similar schoolboy chemistry didn't work quite so well with these other isotopes. He was doing quite well. Um, he in no Thames Valley. So why don't I come on to Thames Valley practice night in Jim Brooks Center? So I went along there and we started talking about the fact we had all these other dancers. And they just, Thames Valley decided that they'd start a sort of revival club meeting outside of the normal practice and started to work up things like Aldington, Wheatley, Bidford and so on. Um, not all material, but key bits. And in fact that worked so well that they were invited to teach Aldington and Wheatley at a ring instructional, uh, 62 or 63, something like that, and so on. And then I began to realise that there were these weekends like this. So I went to one at Halsey Manor, which had been run by Nibs Matthews, which was fascinating because Nibs never actually says a word out of place. You know, he's actually organised the script of what he teaches. He may say it in fall, but everything you know, is to make his point. And it was quite impressive. But every time we, we, he worked up a, a dance or two from the tradition, people said, well, what about, what else is there? You know, what am I looking at? So, you know, I found myself saying, well, there's so-and-so and so-and-so. So I would so even push forward to teach the dances. And the next year, that's 64, Bob Bradbury, who organised the Morris Williams, uh, it asked me to come down and be the leader of the weekend. And that's really how I started getting involved in weekends of this sort. Um, the pattern then was exactly the same. We arrived Friday tea time. We got Friday night, Saturday, um, Sunday until you were exhausted rather than having to go home. Um, the only difference was in those days we used to um, have a run a public dance on the Saturday evening. Now, this is always fascinating because what Bob would do was organise a couple of coach loads of women. <laughs> you know, um, which was always amusing because for some reason or other, the Morris weekend all seemed to clash with a major dance of the area. You know, I don't know who he had it in for, um, but we used to have these wonder, wonderful evenings which were completely, I won't say wild, but they were quite way out in some of the things we did, like um, we got a Wheel of Fortune made, which had all the standard glossary figures of country dancers on. And we got, each person came up there and spun it four times, and we did whatever they turned up with. <laughs> Some of them were near impossible, and at least one man, because <laughs> we had things like leapfrog, and it leapfrogged down the set and went out the room and we never saw them again. <laughs> and, so on. Um, and of course, we, we invited other people like Julia Pilling to come and teach a little bit Northwest before anybody would do Northwest. Uh, we've got um, uh, Jack Brown to come along and talk about literature because not long after the recovery of the literature, and he'd been there. And he could tell us about how it all happened and what, how they reconstructed, and so on. And um, that generated, those, that from there into 71, generated um, a number of people, like Tim Medford, who got quite excited by what he was learning at the, and they went, people went off and formed sites, and there were quite a few sites fell out at that sort of bit. But then they doubled the price. No, and it decided that there was no way we were, you know, Morris dancers could actually pay the sort of price that they needed. But the next thing that happened, of course, was Cardiff. Mm -hmm. The Cardiff men thought 
you know, a weekend's a great idea. You know, and they had access to Boys Town down in St. Athens, also. Yeah. Yes. That's That's a, yeah. Yeah. Underneath the power station. Bloody cold, like yeah. the power station in the it was yeah. like this time of the year. That I have to say, this is the only weekend I've ever run. Where everybody wore all clothes that you wore. Room for Morris men wearing duffel coats, and gloves, hats, and so on, and double pullovers and so on. And even then, you were cold. We were dancing in an aircraft hangar with no heating. Yes. Oh, it really was good. It was, a, it was a gymnasium that could hold. But the staff, the staff looked forward to us coming because they said, trying to get your way through all this beer, as well as actually having the, you know, the practice on. And that's why I go to bed Carnival Puff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way no. of passing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was also, that was another generation of dancers from you know, through a western that um, came along to that. And I think, again, I think it did a lot of good because it got people in their lives. They could let us off go and get to grips with all these things. I'm not sure why it ended, but we, we had started to negotiate with Great Western um, about trying to run a, um, a weekend under the uh, grandstand at the race course at Exeter.
course, that the state playing more cluey cut, the jacket with their cluey and so on. That thing had quite well. We had a, a percussion workshop. I had the, um, the leader, I can't think of his name at the moment, leader of one of the famous bands, recorders, uh, to come along. He was the melody, and we all had stones or tambourines or things of that sort, you know. And what I love about him is that he said, play a real, you know, get people clapping away. Uh, that's when some of the people discovered that the, the pitch of note depending on where you hit the stone. Yeah. It's amazing what appeals to simple people. <laughs> but when I said they play a jig, he played the same tune. <laughs> I asked him for something 5 4, he just added a note to each button. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of musician. Yeah. I was quite impressed. <laughs> yeah. um, but that was one. Now, the, the outshot of that is that we had a, um, a singing group, Stone something or other, a couple on, and they had a little uh, uh, puppet. Used to play around. You know, they used to uh, have a bit of fun with the audience, they might usually. So we thought they're getting a bit over the top. So Tabby and I organised the night so that uh, when they did their show at the Jewel Hall, we got the people at the back. Every time they actually did something funny, everybody laughed up roars and fell off their seat, rolled their back, <laughs> their legs in the air. You know, now this threw them a bit. But when they started the wave of the bow and getting to all clap, when everybody started clapping two big pebbles together, <laughs> they, had, they stopped and actually said, what's going on? And so we, we did explain that in fact, yeah, we did think it was a lot of fun, but uh, you know, what about a bit of singing and you know, being a bit reasonable? Well, the point about that, I don't know, is that the, with these so deputy, two of the workshops were they women's ritual dance. Um, and the problem was, what could you do which the men weren't doing? So there was some northwest, there was some stage, and this and everything. Uh, and some of the women who were there actually went away, and during the following winter, signs were fought the way in the country. They started discussing the situation with Betty, Betty Rivers, and that led very quickly to the formation of the uh, Morris Federation. Now, the Morris Federation you know, the problem with that, it had to be called Women's Morris Federation to start with because the ring was very anti and they all threatened to join the men's side with Jordan, it would open to everybody. And that would have killed it in that sort of stage. That attitude's gone. All those people who took their ideas um, have gone, I'm pleased to say. I actually put up with it because um, I was actually a member of the advisory came to the ring for two or three years, representing the West of England, giving me all the shot. <laughs> um, but I remember I was involved because you know, I actually know what the people actually were saying about it at the time. But the thing about the Federation is that it needed workshops. Now, do some of you remember Albert said of Tame? You know, um, Tubby realised that in fact the trouble with the West of England is that nothing happened the weekend of the Albert Hall Festival. You know, it, all the EFDS stopped. <coughs> and he realised there was a market for a weekend at the university, which he called Albert Ed Tech, for good reason, is the Albert Hall bit somewhere. And that required uh, instructionals and so on. So we started um, working together. Now I met Tommy for the first time in the National Forum, <coughs> God knows when that was then. Um, and he <coughs> hadn't actually long started doing so. But he got involved in the university, and therefore I got involved in the university. I got involved by Betty with the Federation, which meant we started running workshops. Um, my attitude was that, that uh, everybody should dance if they want to, and they should be taught by people who care about it, not by second-rate men dancers, which was happening to some of the sides, and so on. So I started running with Elegant, so I was involved, um, running old workshops at Alpha 15, involved with the Morris Federation and so on. And as I got involved with Bath City, um, Tubby was all saying, well, what else is there? What else do they know? It's a thing for them to work up. So we had a policy. We started, I think, with Duckington. We did Duckington one year with them. And we'll talk about that when we did Duckington tomorrow. And then we did Stanton, and then we did Ascot, and so on. It was really taking the things with a bit more scrappy information 
and actually try and pull together. We were so successful, I think we were the only university side that ever asked to run a Morrisville instructional. And we did that into a song. Oh, which reminds me, we talk about instructional. We were, I know where I was when President Kennedy was assassinated. <laughs> we were teaching Morris and running a dance at Sheffield University. Um, that's a long tale as well, I bet. Uh, I had two children. Yeah. And so, and yeah. so I got involved with the ODA's Federation and just when I thought life was going to be so quiet and um, I don't know how it arose, but then people started saying, well, what about running some weekends together? Uh, I can't even remember now where the first one was. I know we did one at Brighton. How And that's one I waited in Norwich. In, in the snowfields. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's the first of this series. Because that was, in fact, we had let this sort of number in a room about this size. And so on. And um, so we, they started. Um, it rapidly failed that the trouble about something comes around every year. Is what I discovered in running workshops at Sidmouth that the inspiration of music it doesn't work on an annual basis. You actually, to present something fresh, you actually have to see a lot more you know, and think about it being bold. And it was a good idea to actually run workshops which were separated by two more seasons, which meant they became 18 months apart. And that's why this series <coughs> is running on in 18 months apart. If I'm honest, I gave up dancing seriously when I was 41. Um, as Abingdon's numbers grew local people were there, it wasn't really a place for myself and my children uh, to dance. Um, the workshops were in fact my only moment, aside from filming seriously of course, for 62 onwards. Um, and that kept me going, well, I suppose, till about 1980. And then the whole new fashion life was in fact, um, with, what? She and her friend Mary came to see me and sort of said, hey, um, We've lost our squire and footman. You know, um, can I recommend something? So I went over and got involved in it for oh, that was the second year, wasn't it? Uh, three or four years of that. And then um, when they were sort of happily running themselves, then I had another bunch down at all who um, I think there was a core of Morris wives down there that um, they wanted to to dance. They didn't want to do Cotswold or what other people were doing. In fact, they didn't really want to be a clock side out. You know, Midland Rose became a sort of garland and foreign dance troupe and so on. Um, and I must have been with them seven or eight years, perhaps ten. And then the same sort of thing happened to Fleet. The Fleet uh, were lost the musician and the squire, so they moved down to the West Country. And again, I was asked, did I know anybody who Play. And I felt that it would be a great idea to do that because they only practice their court in the light room. So I got involved with them. Um, as a result of that, these three women's sides I've worked with uh, were very satisfying to be with because of the, the way they worked together. It gave me a chance to really play and play in a serious sort of way so I could play decently for dancing. So on, and gave me an opportunity to really keep passing on dances. Yeah. Um, but with most sides, it comes a stage when they mature, you know, they've got a large repertoire, they know what they're doing and why they're doing it, um, and the innovation bit tangles off a bit. You know, and I tend to look for past as new as I have in the past. Um, but now I'm in my terminal state. Um, I'm consistently tried to make material available. I didn't hesitate to help Lionel Bacon by providing a material I had to contribute to it. And I have a stack like this of copies of mine and his correspondence to actually get the material. What was pleasing about Lionel, well, pleasing in a way, is that he wrote up dances in the Morris book, which some of which I wouldn't have accepted. You know, I would have thought the evidence is too slender. But you do have this problem. If you're trying to uh, count for what was, you see, uh, 
Um, there's only a limit, limit amount of information. You just have to say, well, this is what we've got. Uh, um, this is how you can interpret it in terms of um, what we do already. And again, that's meant to be part of the theme of tomorrow, to actually pick a tradition and actually say, well, this is what we knew, and this is what we did. And also, this is what we didn't realise we didn't know. Uh, that's terribly important. Now, the motivations for all this, first of all, is in love of the Morris, the people involved, but really to get people dancing. And dancing in a, I want to say a traditional way, because that really doesn't apply at all, but dancing where they were in charge of what they did. You know, the problem when I started was, in fact, there was the way to do this, the way to do that. And if it didn't quite match somebody's idea of what that had to be, you know, somebody was actually comparing to. And when you saw a mass dance at a ring meeting in the 60s, there really was a mass dance. They all did the same sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so some of the things, tricks that we were up to, first of all, we got the repertoire up from 80 to 360 dances. And the basis of that was that I was probably the only one who knew them all. <laughs> uh, everybody else had to select what they did. So you chose that your dancers. Now I thought that was a step forward. The second thing was discovering that what was printed, like Sharp's book, what was in his manuscripts or in other people's manuscripts, it was always different. Even one collector going to the same person who's got a different thing, different notation, different idea what it is, than another person seeing the same person. So we ended up with Adderbury, um, Janet Blunt and her friends collected the Adderbury Morris, she wrote up four books on the stuff at different times, and they all, each of these four books differ somewhat, but they're not the same as the Sharp published. You know, Sharp collected them separately, you know, they're the same man, and Sharp saw the man five or six years after Janet Brown and the friends, and then you end up with something different. So realising that there was a difference. Now the, the way to make an impact on people is to actually say, the manuscripts are so-so. Yeah, rather than, uh, oh, but that's the way it's Sharp published it, or that's the way the EFTSS teach it. Now, that was another thing. So I, I fondly imagine that the EFTSS, um, you could talk to people who were taught by Sharp, or at least people like the Tony Morris, who actually met the old dancers, and they could tell you what they did, what they saw. And in a sense, yes, these people remembered they were taught by Sharp, or by Douglas Kennedy, or they had met these cops or dancers. But when you ask them, what did they do? All these people will show you is what they did the last time they did it. Mm. You know, people are not actually <coughs> normal people. I don't mean actors. They're not good at mimicking or showing you know, somebody's better. They can only do it their, their actual way. And um, that came as quite a surprise. Um, another surprise I got was some, some years back we saw the Bampton side dancing at Edward Murdo. And they're all old friends. Well, so they're people I remember when they started at the pit, Bampton dancing. And I suddenly realised that these people were dancing like the old men did back in the mid 50s. I thought, well, that's a bit strange. Why is that? So you could, I always rationalised the fact that Bampton dancers vary, is that they were all taught at different times. You know, those people who are at the war, you know, one way doing a side step, people who were in the 50s and other way. So on, and I can shoot them. And it isn't like that at all. What I'd actually see was people getting old. And all these old men that I had seen in the 1850s, early 60s, you know, were, they danced like they did because they were old. You know? And this Bampton lot, when I saw them, these people who I knew as teenagers or early 20s, you know, when they were in their 50s, you know, danced like old men. You know? And that's when I get to realise again the mechanics of movement and so on is important. And the fact that when you're older and stiffer, you, know, you can't do things, how you modify it, and so on. And then you start looking at clubs around the country to realise, yeah, it applies to everybody. You know, those sides, when they get old, actually start dancing like old people. Great discovery, yeah. I should have realised that right at the too. Um, but then, that, I come back to the question of, you know, why do people have trouble recruiting people? Why do they recruit people in their own <coughs> country? People who dance like themselves have the same sort of attitudes and so on. 
you don't <coughs> consciously try and set up for newcomers the way Morris was for you when you started when you were young. You know, to have it, to belong to a young club, you've got to let the young people run it, like it happened when you were in your side when it started. So, and of course, that's it, quite impractical. Uh, so, sides come and go. Uh, one shouldn't be surprised that things, because um, yeah, almost every other social thing, things come and go. Now, the image of the history of Morris is that it started a long time ago and it ran on fairly steadily. And then social condition changed, so it sort of stopped somewhere at the back end of the 19th century. Uh, but it didn't stop for long, we had a revival. You know, they went back to you see, and that, I think, is the image of the history of the Morris for a long time. But of course it isn't like that. The history of the Morris is it goes in cycles. The, the Morris that started in the 1500 had more or less gone the 1600. The Morris that started in the 1700 had gone by 1840. You know, and again, although we know the Morris and the Cotswold ran on to the First World War, it hardly ran on. You know, sides hardly turned out and so on. In fact, all we know, all the kids chapter knows, is about the period of Cotswold Morris and severe decline. All we know is about what happens when it's no longer a popular activity. And of course, the revival, which we tend to look at um, 1912 or 1924 as a start of it, never caught on between the wars. You know, the Morris really got to go again in the mid 50s. And we've seen a couple of surges of numbers of people getting involved. You know, I'm not sure if it's levelling off yet. But bearing in mind that I've talked about these sort of hundred year pulses, three generations, not unreasonable thing about it, somebody discovers the horse, or discovers something, you know. Next generation picks it up because it's great, they've dented it. You know, you know. Then the next generation comes along and says, oh, I'd like to see something done different. You know, and they pick up something else. The sword dancing is in that sort of way as well. <coughs> the, the early references to sword dancing are confusing, first of all, because <coughs> the martial arts, the English martial arts group, of which Tony Baker is the sort of uh, president of the dreamer, has revived the uh, sword, um, whatever the group, not the group, the, 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 well, that's the long oh. stick. Well, you know, they've been reviving that and they've actually, they've looked at these early materials from that point of view. And I just, I realised that they were talking about the same sources as we were talking about for the early references to sword dance. You see? But they say that it can't be a Hilton Point sword dance because the chap who taught it and ran that display was a fencing, fencing master. You know, this was fencing to music. You see? Now, a little bit more deeper look at it, it shows that the early sword dancers were in Hill Point, but not in a circle, they were in a long line. And the people were actually doing the sort of thing you do by just joining hands. You know, snails, arches, and things like that. The sort of thing which survived as adult dancers and children dancers, at least with living memory. So on. And the Hilton Point uh, way of doing things and the fact that it's topological variations on, is something of the 18th century, early 18th century. And again, that was dying out by the back end of the 19th century, another century long sort of pulse and so on. So you have to look at it as the Morris, like anything else, comes and goes. It comes and goes because fashion is, or, or interest. It's not driven by the Morris. Uh, it's driven by eight side things. And it was recently thinking about um, where we're going now, because of the fact that if you go to a pub, you know, it's very often either, like the Fleet's case, full of young people who've got two benches on the door and say, it's not a good idea for you to come in tonight. Or um, it's a restaurant. You know, and don't disturb people. The chef's busy cooking, you know, and so on and so on. So the, the good pubs are getting fewer and far between them. Uh, so on. And the thing that was worrying me is that the Morris may be full of enthusiasts like yourself, 
but there isn't actually anybody going to pay any attention to us. You know? um, so, so often, sides um, intuitively meet with other sides. You know, we, we're coming in, we're looking for them. <coughs> well, I mean, it's the way it is. But it's not something to be great. I think it's just it happens. The, the world out there is like it is. And there's nothing the Morris can do to change it. You know? The Morris has got a great history of adapting to the world it finds itself in. You know, at the start, back in the um, early 16th century, you know, Morris was actually paid for by the church, by um, local guilds, merchants, things like that. You know, it's a conspicuous consumption type thing. You know? um, and then the world changed. We had the Reformation, we had the Protestants, who actually thought anything Catholic, i.e. Morris Nazi, uh, really wasn't a good thing. And some of the bishops started to persecute the Morris. I mean, the Archbishop of York put out a proclamation in, in uh, the North of England um, banning Morris dancers from dancing in church, particularly during the sermon. <laughs> 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 Talent, 
more she do things with ordinary people who have stuff to do. And so on. Uh, and <coughs> the analogue that I see at the moment, I've been reading a recent book by Ron Hatton, who's a professor of history at Bristol, who wrote a number of reviews of folk events, you know, like the Morris and like this, yeah, the truth of it. And he's written the book about witchcraft, about Wicca, the modern history of Wicca. Again, we've talked about that on another occasion. Um, but it's, it's not very old, but the attitude of the people who do it reads remarkably like the attitude of people who do the Morris. The rhythmic movement, the groups, I mean, the stories about covens you know, match the stories about Dowdenhurst and what we know, our own experience of dealing with a typical Morris club. You know, uh, why they come together, what the experience they get from someone. Right. Have I got you bored in the high? I think some people are going to bed already. <laughs> yeah. Ten past eleven. Yeah, there's a clock over here. I'm just going to now we're just sat there, I can see it. <laughs> well, this is the traditional time that we uh, put a day late in the evening, where we actually try and be a bit philosophical about what we do. That's all right. Um, the real question, you know, that we never see most people, is what do you actually get out of the voice? Because what one gets out of the virus ought to determine what we're doing with it. You know, what we're putting into it. So. And the big fault failing is that people like myself who actually say the virus is like this, or the virus is like this, or there's this idea that if you fed them, you're actually any you know, due concern with what actually you're supposed to be getting from it. Do you not think that changed quite a lot over that 70 one to 78, 79, where you, Tubby, you other people were throwing out so much and a hell of a lot of people were taking that and turning it into something that they wanted. So, yes, in a lot of cases, maybe you came into it because you had nothing better to do that night or you somebody or whatever it was. But then there was so much that was new. And there was a lot that you could say, right, we're going to do this with that, it's ours now. And most, I just looking around the room, there's quite a few people here who have actually stuck with that. Um, maybe that's the thing that's a bit strange at the moment, that somebody starting or whatever, there's less leeway to say, oh, I'll take that and I'll make, I don't know, maybe. But there was a huge amount going on. You can reel off a dozen sides without much problem in that period that took out of something. Some, and it was a small thing. It wasn't like, you know, you were saying, I, I started with Kemp's men in Norwich, which was made a virtue of not joining the ring. <laughs> but it was still, you know, the first week you were allowed to do the sick dance. Well, mindfully, because I was fortunate to be involved with traditional sides, and that's a debate of what we do to the people who knew their dancers belonged to them. Uh, Realising that, in fact, that was a good way forward. You know, they had each club had its own pace style, as it were, and its own dance, which belonged to them. It's their own interpretation, their way of doing it. You know, and, um, it just made the, the team distinctive to itself and between them and other people. And I mean, when I stopped to think of the, the good songs, when I might be, people might like to go and watch them like Great West, or do that in, and so on, they have a distinctive interpretation. But isn't that the, you know, what my is saying is that there, there is a distinction, and that, what, what, what's the sustaining distinction between the sides that have had an excuse to 